Let's focus our study of quantum many-body physics on uh, the simplest quantum system, which is uh, the quantum number associated with spin or angular momentum, for example, of the electron. This neglects all other complications due to position, momentum, uh, charge, spin-orbit coupling, hyperfine splitting, all these things that occur uh, in electrons, and only focuses on uh, the single object, which is the spin. We'll consider spin one-half, which gives us an effective two-state quantum system. Uh, we can consider, in some basis, the spin, of, for example, of an electron to be, uh, say, up or down. So a quantum spin uh, has, has uh, angular momentum properties. So you can think of it as being a vector with different components. And we can simplify the many-body problem even further uh, by just considering uh, a classical spin uh, that only has, say, for example, an SZ component. So we pick a preferred axis for the axis for the angular momentum, and let's consider interactions between n spins uh, that just occur between the Z components uh, of, of their angular momentum. So that interaction could be, for example, SIZ dot SJZ. And I could form a Hamiltonian, uh, which is the uh, fundamental uh, object that governs all the time evolution in the Schrodinger equation for a classical uh, set of spins, for example, like this. So here's a sum over all uh, possible pairs of SZ spins. Here's an interaction, which I've left arbitrary. And here's the interaction term between the two SZ operators, SZI. S said J. This is referred to as something you've probably heard of, the Ising model. The Ising model is the sort of simplest model of interacting spins, yet it is actually very, very highly complex uh, in and of itself. So the Ising model is typically used to embody not only physical processes, for example, in the study of quantum magnetism or classical magnetism even, uh, but it's, it's used to encode optimization problems, uh, uh, which is something you may have encountered before. So you may want to be looking for, for example, the lowest energy state of this of system governed by this equation, and that would be an optimization procedure. You're looking for the spin configurations of the n-body spins that give you the lowest energy as dictated by this Hamiltonian. So one way you can imagine doing that optimization procedure would be uh, to look through all possible spin configurations. Let me call a spin configuration X, and here's an example. There's n different spins. They're in an SZ configuration or SZ configuration. And I look at all uh, possible configurations and calculate the energy according to this Hamiltonian. So that's one example of a state or a configuration. I can imagine some other example. Up, down, down, up up. That would be another example, x prime. And to search through all possible states would be to search through a very large number, a highly complex uh, system of 2 to the n possible different states. How big is 2 to the n in this many-body problem? Its exponential is very large. So you know 2 to the 1, you know 2 to the 2, 2 squared is 4, 2 to the 3 is 8. Uh, this escalates very quickly. If I imagine a system of only 40 interacting SZ components of spin, so classical components of spin, I get a number that's 7 times 10 to the 22. The reason I chose this number is this represents uh, the, uh, all, all the data that is currently uh, stored on all of the Earth's computers. All of our computers, all of our hardware, all of our memory, uh, the dark web, everything is approximately 10 to the 22 bits of information. So imagine searching through all those bits of information. It, you, you can quickly see that it's an intractable problem. Similarly, performing this optimization problem brute force, say, for example, finding the lowest energy of, of an Ising model, is a similarly difficult problem. When I get up to a number as small as 268, uh, which is uh, just a, you know, a couple hundred spins, uh, that number balloons up to 10 to the 80. The reason I chose 10 to the 80 is this is the number of all particles in the known universe. So if you imagine even wanting to store a state, 
sort of store, if you will, all the possible configurations or snapshots uh, of configurations possible for models like this, you can see that it's essentially physically impossible. This, this illustrates the sort of high complexity uh, of, the, of the, even the classical world of interacting spins. So obviously we don't do this uh, when we study physical systems. Uh, in physical systems, what we do is we look at probabilistic distributions. So probability distribution that governs, uh, for example, the, the uh, amount of spin configurations and the, and the type that might occur, for example, in a magnet at some temperature. So you might be familiar with that as the Boltzmann distribution, where this beta here is 1 over Boltzmann constant times T. That gives us the probability uh, that a configuration that I've labeled as X occurs at some temperature. And what I need to know, essentially, is the HX, or the energy that's uh, governing that uh, configuration. This object here is the normalization or partition function. It's a fundamentally important object. And it essentially runs over a sum over all possible configurations uh, and, and is weighted by the Boltzmann weight. So this would run over all configurations x, let me just label it like this, from 1 to 2 to the n. So that partition function is a fundamentally complex object. In order to calculate it, you essentially have to do these, these almost infinite sums when, when n gets very large. And that, only through that procedure, only by performing that sum or that trace, are we able to calculate physical uh, quantities such as the magnetization. So for example, if all of these were pointing up, I might say the magnetization per spin is 1. I would have to calculate that for every uh, single configuration, and this thing's weighted by a Boltzmann weight and normalized by the partition function. So that's a common problem that we encounter in uh, physics and chemistry uh, and so on. And it's really the realm of statistical mechanics and thermodynamics. So if you take a StatMech class or a thermodynamics class, you will get strategies for how to deal with these very large sums, typically in some sort of probabilistic way. That's, that was all classical. What I've done is ignored those two components of spin. But imagine my Hamiltonian for my Ising model also had a quantum piece. So an off-diagonal matrix element, if you will. This is the actual Hamiltonian of the D-Wave device, uh, in some sense, if I, uh, if I restrict uh, the sort of arbitrariness of these JIJ interactions. So what D-Wave is doing is applying what we call a transverse field or an off-diagonal uh, field in order to simplify the, um, if you will, the optimization problem for finding the ground state of this Hamiltonian. So the fundamental difference between quantum and classical Hamiltonians is these are now operators. The spin states, so which I represent as a, a basis ket, uh, our, our state, our vectors in this state space, in the Hilbert space. And an operator like the sigma, sorry, the SZ operator is a matrix. So this object, this quantum Hamiltonian, is a very large matrix. It's actually, it's actually a matrix uh, of 2 to the n, which is the size of the Hilbert space, uh, times 2 to the n. <coughs> So that matrix, the solution, if you will, of the quantum many-body problem is essentially diagonalizing that matrix. It's taking that matrix and finding all of the uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors that are governed by the time-independent Schrodinger equation. Diagonalizing a matrix numerically for a problem like this is known to cost uh, of order m to the cubed where m is the size of the Hilbert space, 2 to the n. So you can see how this diagonalization procedure escalates very quickly. In fact, it escalates so quickly that state-of-the-art uh, diagonalization routines, uh, which um, are run on problems of high symmetry, typically can only reach an n, which is a number of qubits, uh, of 30 to 40, say. What those diagonalization procedures give you then is an energy eigenvalue and also a state wave function, which is made up of a linear uh, superposition uh, or a linear combination of 
all of these possible snapshots that I talked about over here. So there's two to the n elements in this linear combination, uh, each one of them which can have a complex coefficient. So the coefficient that uh, is associated with this linear combination doesn't have, even have to be real or positive. We'll talk more about that. This difficulty of this problem and, and this small size that's typically achieved by even state-of-the-art diagonalization routines gives us the concept of quantum supremacy. So quantum supremacy is the idea that we can do better than this only with a quantum computer.